Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Backer. Welcome to Write Better Stories. Neither Pringle nor Lawrence will be joining me today because uh, Lawrence was being really loud and Pringle has been biting me a lot recently. He was actually pretty good today, but um, today it's just going to be me. And I'm going to be going through a really good paragraph in this book called Gravity's Rainbow. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. This is considered one of the like postmodern Bibles. And I think that this section in particular really lays out a lot of postmodern ideas. And so today I'm going to be talking about the smell that he uses and what that does for a piece of fiction and specifically for this theme that he's laying out. Um, dismantling the binary between life and death. And then I'm also going to be talking about this, diff uh, this kind of like postmodern philosophical idea after that that I don't really know what to call. But in any event, I'm just going to start reading, and then I will get into those three things right afterward. So this is at a section at the very beginning of the book where Pirate Prentice is baking bananas into all different kinds of foods like crepes and pancakes and many different things. Now there grows among all the rooms, replacing the night's old smoke, alcohol, and sweat, the fragile, musaceous odor of breakfast, flowery, permeating, surprising, more than the color of wintry sunlight, taking over not so much through any brute pungency or volume as by the high intricacy to the weaving of its molecules, sharing the conjurer's secret by which, though it is not often death is told so clearly to fuck off, the living genetic chains prove even labyrinthine enough to preserve some human face down ten or twenty generations. So the same assertion through structure allows this war morning's banana fragrance to meander, repossess, prevail. Is there any reason not to open every window and let the kind scent blanket all Chelsea as a spell against falling objects? Okay, there is a ton that is in there to unpack, and... Uh, I just, I don't even have the time to get into all of it, to be perfectly honest, because that's just a really beautifully written section here. And again, I think it really lays out a lot of the ideas that he's trying to get at in this book as a whole, which is difficult to summarize, because um, the plot of the book is almost irrelevant to the themes, or not irrelevant to the themes, but it's so much smaller than the themes and the true impact of this book and the formal things that he's doing with it, and the crazy ideas that he's doing with it. Uh, but that's for most of Thomas Pynchon's books. It's almost like he chose to become a novelist just as a way of getting these wild ideas out there. I love his stories and his characters a lot, but again, what really gets me excited about these books are just the ideas and the prose. It's, it's really amazing and inspiring in that regard. So, um, one of the first things that I'd like to talk about is just the use of smell that he's using in this little section here, and this is important both for fiction and for this theme that he's getting at here. And the theme I'll talk about first um, is pretty much laid out at the beginning of this section of the book, which is also the beginning of the book itself. The little inscription, which is a quote from Werner von Braun, Nature does not know extinction. All it knows is transformation. Everything science has taught me and continues to teach me strengthens my belief in the continuity of our spiritual existence after death. So uh, I think just the fact that he's using the smell of these bananas as opposed to just the theme of bananas themselves in this section um, is a really smart way of talking about or exemplifying like a disembodied spirit. It is not the banana itself, but it is the smell of the bananas. It's that musaceous odor of breakfast. And if you don't know, which I definitely didn't, musaceous um, is the adjective form of the kind of tree of which a banana is a smaller subset, so leave it to Thomas Pynchon to know the word for that. Um, I'm sure he looked it up, or uh, maybe he did just know that musaceous was the word to use. But again, by talking about it in terms of the smell that's going around is a really smart way of, yeah, talking about something as though it is a disembodied spirit, which I think is a very prevalent theme in this book in general. There is a lot of talk about people channeling spirits from the other side, of apparitions and ghosts. And I would hate to give away the very, very end of the book right here, but I'm assuming if you're watching this video that you've, uh, that you've read this book before. Um, if not, plug your ears, but this is just such a powerful line at the very, very end of the book. Um, I believe it's like you as an audience, I'm pretty sure I'm interpreting this correctly at the very end of the book. It's you as a reader in the audience with all the other readers, I guess, and there's a song that's on the movie, 
and uh, they're they're singing, and it basically says like a face on every mountainside and a soul in every stone, um, and that just gives me chills every single time that I read it, because um, the, yeah, that that is a big concern of this book in general is of, of this idea of spirituality versus materiality, or materialism, and. I think what's really interesting is that a lot of like postmodernism does get a bad rap for being such a deconstructive uh, thing that's just out to dismantle everything that we know. And um, the fact that there is so much spirituality through this book and so many alternative narratives of understanding the world beyond scientific materialism kind of flies in the face of a lot of that. And so I don't know if that just means that Thomas Pynchon transcends the like postmodern generic ethic toward dismantling everything, or if people just don't really understand postmodernism in that way, that um, it's not necessarily that our traditional modes for understanding things are totally bullshit and we won't replace them with anything, but there, there's all these other ways of understanding the world out there too, such as the fact that material objects can have some sort of spiritual life within them as well. Now, I would say even apart from him asserting any sort of divine quality to this, you can just look at this as a very linguistic thing. That it's, we've got the object itself, but then also the understanding or the concept of that object on top of that, you can look at as a sort of spiritual thing that is disembodied from that object that it's trying to describe. And this is a very classic theme in postmodern language philosophy, postmodern philosophy in general. Um, it, yes, yeah, it just screams postmodernism, this separating the concept from the thing that it's talking about. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more after I talk about this uh, next thing, is that to me this entire banana section is him also furthering this point in the book of dismantling the difference between life and death. That um, this is a classically postmodern theme as well, is to take a binary like life and death and to just say that they're so inextricably linked that they define each other, and so you can't really have it that one is completely separate from the other. And so the backdrop for this sequence in the book is that it is deathly cold in the winter in England, but then these tropical fruits are growing. And so again, I think that this is a very concrete way of demonstrating that theme that basically within the dead of winter we have this budding tropical life that um, everybody is getting very excited about. Um, all the, the, like, soldiers that are about to eat all of Pirate Prentice's banana pancakes and crepes. And I think they make, like, banana coffee, too, or, like, banana milk. I don't know. It's all, all kinds of weird banana stuff. Um, and that's not me just, like, reading that into this section. He literally equates this idea of bananas to death. That this musaceous odor that's permeating the maisonette that they're staying in... Um, it's, uh, it basically permeates as by the high intricacy to the weaving of its molecules, sharing the conjurer's secret by which, though it is not often, death is told so clearly to fuck off. The living genetic chains prove even labyrinthine enough to preserve some human face down 10 or 20 generations. So there's a lot, even just in that tiny little section. But, um... Yeah, he's, he literally says that it's these things that are telling death to fuck off, these bananas. So again, I'm not, I'm not just reading into the image of bananas growing in the winter. He's saying that more explicitly right here. And again, that's something that a big part of this book is concerned with in general, of just talking about uh, spirits and that life and death are just two sides of the same coin. And uh, yeah, I think I've, I've hopefully laid that out well um, in that regard. But this last part that I really wanted to talk about is... What he says that the living genetic chains prove even labyrinthine enough to preserve some human face down 10 or 20 generations. Oh my lord. That is, that is just too cool. The image that he is building right there is that, one, he's just making a cool comment about how the fact that these individual people are in some way just these material vehicles for this sweeping singular force, this face that is basically going through all of these different people, but then he's also talking about how this disembodied odor of the banana is similar to that. So it is the conjurer's secret that is basically making it so that both the human face and the odor can imbue itself into all sorts of places that you would not 
under traditionally scientific material understanding assume them to be. Hopefully that made sense. But um, when I read that line about the human faces down 10 or 20 generations, again, that just that just was like amazing. And what is so exciting reading a, like anything by Thomas Pynchon is that he'll just be, you know, just some silly little scene about bananas. And then before you know it, he's making some enormous comment on life and death. And, and then they just jump right back into the action. So uh, um, I'm going to try to just leave it at that today. I hope I did a good job of explaining the themes within that and about how um, oh, I, I said I was going to return to how that is a postmodern thing, um, and hopefully, uh, you know what? I think I'm, I think I am going to leave it at that today. I think uh, maybe leave it a shorter video. So, hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I don't know if that will help you write better stories because it's super crazy. Maybe if you're writing a story about postmodernism, you can use that. Um, specifically talking about smell, this is a frequent note that I get in a lot of the fiction that I write is that I just don't use smell a lot. I think mostly of like characters and dialogue, but um, a lot of your craft as a fiction writer is to sort of evoke the sensory aspects of the scene or what your characters might be going through so that they can empathize and engage a little bit more with what you're talking about. So there you go. There's a little half-assed fiction advice right at the end for you. Hope you enjoyed. Write better stories. Goodbye.